I had mentioned that Jake McCauley is here, and um, just a little bit about him. He serves as the chief executive officer of the institution, Institute on the Constitution, an educational outreach that presents the founders' American view of law and government. It has produced thousands of graduates in all 50 states with a full understanding of the biblical principles of which America's founding documents are based. He's former co-host of a talk show, The Sons of Liberty. He is an ordained minister and has spoken to audiences nationwide and has established the American Club, a constitutional study group in public and private schools. Jake has been seen on Yahoo News, Fox News, The Blaze, AP, CBS, NBC, and The Weekly Standard, and more. So let's give Jake a hand. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you to Pastor Steve, and also um, Joe Alvarez. Are you here today? Where's Joe? Joe. Okay, he's back there. All right. Well, thank you to Joe, because he picked me up from the airport and drove me here, and also Buck and Patty Edgars. Are they in here again? Well, anyways. Hey, guys. How you doing, Buck? Thank you very much. I'm staying with them, and I'm very gracious, or they graciously fed me last night at the old mill, what, what's it called, the old, yes, and I ate so much, it's pathetically crazy. I kept going back. There was a lot to eat. Oh, I better turn this on as well. Well, I'm excited to be here this morning for a couple reasons. Number one, I love your pastor very much, and I am grateful to Pastor Steve for allowing me this opportunity he is one of the pastors that we regularly pray for. He's a black robe regimen pastor. He speaks on the full counsel of God. It's not just about what's inside of these four walls. He's got a heart for outreach, and he speaks on a topic that I take very seriously because I see right now our Christian liberties. I think this mic still might be on. Is that, is that right? Well, it was echoing there for a second. Our Christian liberties are under attack right now, and they're not under attack by Islam. They're not under attack by an enemy that we can visually see and know as our enemy, they're under attack by public policy. Wouldn't you agree? Doesn't that seem where Christians are getting the most problems nowadays? It's from public policy. A lot of Christians are getting drugged into courts for not wanting to bake a cake, for not wanting to provide flowers for a wedding that's antithetical to their biblical faith. 
Now, those aren't things that we used to know happened in America. Those were things that happened in communist countries and countries that had a philosophy of atheism that ruled their nation, but now they're happening in America, which I believe is still the greatest nation in the world. Our values and our systems have been codified in laws that we as Christians can experience liberty in, but for some reason we're not today. Would you guys agree? It seems like the most persecuted people, uh, some of you guys must be in college, am I right? Some of you guys in college, college age at least. Would you say that you get more persecution if you walk into a college nowadays, if you're a Muslim or if you're a Christian? It does appear that way, doesn't it? How about in a public school? If you want to pray, take off your shoes and wash your feet in the sink, would you get in any trouble if you were a Muslim? But if you want to pray during lunch hour as a Christian and invite your fellow students to do it, students are getting in trouble for that. Putting Bible verses up on banners for the football team and have them run through it. For some reason, that is an offense where judges literally excoriate little cheerleading girls for doing it. That's just madness, isn't it? Is that the America, mom and dad, that we grew up in? Not even close, is it? Not even close. Well, that's why I have a passion for this subject and for this topic. Coming up soon, we have an election as well. Some of you may have already voted. I don't know, does Ohio do early voting? Okay, so some of you may have already cast that vote. Your suffrage. Did you know in the book of Exodus, I'm not going to have you turn there with me, but in the book of Exodus 18, the book of Exodus, God says, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of thy people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over you to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. What Moses was doing right there was giving a biblical mandate to Christians to elect and select leaders. Our founders understood that portion of scripture. Every pulpit would preach it on election day sermons and tell you as a biblical mandate to everybody the characteristics of the people that you are to place in offices of power over you. And he broke it down, federal, state, and local government. Our founders weren't just brilliant men. They studied brilliant men, and they studied the Bible, and that's what made them brilliant. Before I get rolling, we have a couple things. We have a Facebook page, a Twitter handle, and a YouTube page if you want to follow us. We are the Institute on the Constitution, and we bring people the American view. Before I ever start, I like to do an intelligence test because I want to make sure you're thinking today. This isn't just going to be pulpit brainwashing, okay? So I'm going to randomly call on people and ask questions. So the first question goes for you. How many of each animal did Moses bring in the ark with him? Two? I remember that story differently. See, Moses split the sea. He didn't need an ark. It was Noah who had the ark. That's right. Aren't you glad I didn't call on you? I could see her. (laughs) Sir, um, is it possible to end a sentence with the word the? Yes. It is. Can you give me an example? Is it possible to end a sentence with the word the? Got it. Way to go, man. By the way, it's not as fun if you get it right, so... (laughs) All right, well, I'm not giving you another chance. Uh, What is the name of the raised print, ma'am, that deaf people use? I'm going to go with you. The Braille? That's the blind people. What what do deaf people use? (laughs) They don't. They don't use. There is no raised print. That's right. Okay, is it proper English? Proper English, ma'am. You tried so hard not to look at me, didn't you? (laughs) Is it proper English to say egg yolks is white or egg yolks are white? Egg yolks are white? No, they're yellow. It's not proper English to say either, because it's actually wrong. Good job. That wasn't so painful, was it? Sir, will you spell the word shop out loud? Were you here at the first service? No. Okay, spell the word shop for me. It's right up there. S-H-O-P. One more time. S-H-O-P. What do you do at a green light? You... G-O. Oh. <laughs> Almost said it. Most people say stop. You don't want to follow them out of the parking lot, right? You go. Way to go, guys. And I realize intelligence has a curious type of spelling up there. That is the common core spelling for intelligence. (laughs) Those are my children, Dominic, Joshua, Charity, Micah. And it says in the Constitution, why did our founders bring us this document, this Constitution that's revered through all of the world? For over 200 years, it's been in play. They told us in the preamble, it says... They gave us the Constitution to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Now, some people don't know that word posterity. What it means is our children, our kids. We want them to have liberty. They looked down thousands of years from when they wrote that document and said, man, if people will abide by these principles, 
those children will have liberty. And I think that's something that we need to have nowadays. We need to be farsighted. Whoops. So anyways, my oldest son, they're very smart. They're homeschooled. I would love to show you a video of this, but I ran out of time last time I was preaching, so I can't show you this video of my kids. But they recite the preamble, the Constitution. They got it memorized. They get in garb. My daughter has pink guns, and she does the Second Amendment and pulls them out of holsters. It's just totally cool. You would really love it. You can find it on our website. But uh, my oldest son answered a question in his confirmation class, and the little girl sitting next to him said, it's Dominic up there, um, she said, how did he get so smart, pastor? And the pastor pointed to me in the back of the room and said, see that guy back there? His wife. My wife homeschools them. Um, she does this video, but again, I don't have the extra four minutes, so I am going to just fast forward through that and get right to the topic and to the content. The Bill of Rights, in the Fifth Amendment, Article 5 of the Bill of Rights, says that no person shall be deprived of what? Keep going. Or property. Without what? Due process of law. Unless you've committed a crime, you can't forfeit your life, liberty, or property. Right? So there's three fundamental rights, and I want everybody to go to their Bibles. We're going to go to Genesis. It's a real easy book to find. It's the first one. As a matter of fact, on the first book of the Bible, the first chapter of the Bible, so this is going to be probably be on page one of your Bibles, we're going to go to verse 26. Right there we have, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Our government says that and codified it in the law of this land, the Constitution, but there's a reason why they have the authority to say that. Everything I talk about today, we're going to go to the biblical underpinnings of this document. So we're going to start with verse 26, chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, talking to Christ, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Like that creepy snake that was crawling all over that lady on the slideshow you guys were watching. Wasn't that creepy? Whew. So God came up with the idea in verse 26, and in verse 27, he created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. So God created man. Male and female created he them. Christians understand that God created male and female equally in God's own image. We are not a culture that debases our women under the guise of protecting them. We do not mutilate our women. We do not treat them poorly because we're Christians. And we treat them with the honor and the respect and the dignity that God gave them when he created them. So the very first thing that God created us with is the right to life. And no person shall be deprived of life. Why? Because God gave it and man is not authorized to take it away. So we continue on. God blessed man and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. So right there, God gave them life first, then he gave them liberty. Go be fruitful, replenish, multiply. God gave us liberty, that's why man cannot take away our liberty. He is not authorized, he did not give it, God did. As we continue on, he says, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That would be property. It's an example of when God gave mankind property. So he gave us life, liberty, property, right there in the Bible. Our founders copied that, put it in the Fifth Amendment to the Bill of Rights. Now, how many of you believe that abortion is illegal? Anybody? Show of hands. Some people argue with me. I speak on universities, I speak in high schools, I speak all over the place. And some people say, uh, abortion... Ah, oh, Jake, you're such a dumb Christian. Abortion is not illegal. And do you know why they tell me abortion isn't illegal? Take a guess, anybody? Because why? Why do they think abortion is legal? Because of man. Which specific men have said it's legal? Supreme Court, thank you. The Supreme Court said, Jake, as if we get law from the Supreme Court. Let me just tell you something. The judicial branch is a branch of our government, a very important branch, and it has powers that have been delegated. Judges are important. Would you agree? Judges, though, cannot make law. Judges are referees. It's the best way to understand it. When I go to a game down at Ohio State, 
and I go to that stadium, and you guys are beating up on my poor little gophers. I'm from Minnesota. And so the gophers are there. It's halftime. It's like 50 to zip, right? The gophers are just getting pounded. And in the name of decency and humanity and progressivism and genuine love for mankind, the referees get a huddle at halftime and they say, hey, you know what, fellas? This is not representative of our culture here in Ohio. We're being way too mean to the gophers. We're going to create a new rule to make it fair. So what we're going to do is we're going to give the gophers six downs to try to get their first down. And we're going to give Ohio three. So they come out at halftime and they make that announcement to the crowd. What does the crowd do? Do they stop at booing? Or do they tar and feather those referees? Come on, we're in Ohio State, right? Are you guys still sleeping for crying out loud? It's almost 12 o'clock. <laughs> what do they do? We care about sports so much in this country, those referees wouldn't last for a second. Do you know why? Because the fans are educated about the game. And the referee's job, they are hired and paid money to do one thing, apply the rules to both sides and make sure it's a fair game. Their job is not to recreate the rules, to reinterpret the rules, or to move the rules of the game into a way that they think is fair and just for everybody. Right? They're only referees. So in the same way, our Congress acts and brings forth laws. Those laws are then brought, if somebody breaks the law, a criminal, they go before a judge, and the judge makes sure that that law is applied to them. Does that make sense? So no more of this nonsense of the Supreme Court said, therefore, it must be legal. That is not the case at all. As a matter of fact, do you know why people have actually bought onto the lie that abortion is, illegal, is legal in our country? How many of you believe that we're born free? Or excuse me, born equal? Anybody believe we're born equal? Oh, you guys, you think, ma'am, in the red shirt with the checkers on it, do you believe we're born equal? You do. That sounds great, doesn't it? It's wrong. We're not. Because if we were born equal, then we would have to wait until we're born to be equal. And guess what? They abort babies while they're in the womb. But pretty soon, depending on which representative there gets into the presidency, you're going to see that one of those running for office actually thinks it's okay for an abortion to be performed one hour after the baby is born. You can leave that little baby sitting on the table to suffocate and die by itself. Yes! And there's many Christians voting for that candidate. And I can't say the sex because you'll know exactly who I'm talking about. But you already do. And I'm glad you do. And I'm not afraid of that. Because truth is truth. And we're under war from our enemy. It's a spiritual war and it's a subtle war. And wisdom is the only thing that gives us Knowledge, which is the only thing that keeps us from becoming enslaved as Christians and as people. The Declaration of Independence doesn't say we're born equal. It says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are what? Created equal. And when is a man or a woman created? At what point? That's right. This isn't a birds and bees talk. It's just a fact. We are created in the womb of our mother. Everybody is. And the moment we're created, we have an unalienable right to what? What are the three things, guys? Life, liberty, property, pursuit of happiness. That's exactly right. Because God said it. <clears throat> but this is nonsense. We're creating things now, aren't we? What happens nowadays is, just this is an example, okay? I would like to personally, I would like to fly like Superman. Anybody know Superman? How many of you would love to fly? Yeah, I got all the kids. All the old people, you guys are too old. You need to raise your hand because flying would be so cool. I don't care how old you are. Yes, amen, that's right. So let's just say that I'm a politician today and I want to campaign for your right to fly. That's right. You have a right to fly, sir. But what is stopping your right to fly? Gravity, and what is gravity? It's a force, it's a law. Who created gravity? Gravity. God did. The law of nature is called gravity. It's stopping you from flying. So I have to campaign against the law so that I can create, I create a new right, and then we've got to get rid of the old laws, right? This is what's happening in your country. And here's the way that we typically do it. Women in this room, I am a pro-woman candidate. I love women. I want women to have the right to fly. But gravity hates you because it's sexist, and it will never let a woman fly, ever. GLBT community, I'm pro-GLBT because, you know, 
I just love the GLBT community, and gravity hates homosexuals. It will never let homosexuals fly. Muslims, Buddhists, atheists in this country, I'm so in your court. I'm for you. I don't like how you're being discriminated against by gravity because gravity doesn't let atheists fly. So you need to vote for me. I'll convince my colleagues at Congress that gravity is sexist, homophobic, racist, bigoted. If you're black, don't even think about flying. But I'm on the side of the black person, so I'm going to make sure that gravity is decimated. Well, let's just say I convince enough people that, uh, of my colleagues in Congress, and they all agree, yeah, 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 gravity, that's horrible. Wow, it's rotten. I can't even believe this. Wow, how have we allowed this for so long? And so we pass a law, and we say, you have a right to fly. Gravity is now illegal. And the president wants to be progressive. He wants to lead America to be the first nation of men and women that can fly. So he signs it into law. And then the Supreme Court comes up with a ruling. It gets challenged. It's challenged before the Supreme Court because I know there's some closed-minded, homophobic, bigoted people out there that think that we shouldn't have the right to fly. So they challenge it. And so it goes before the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, well, we are, as people, we are evolving, we are changing, and we've got to keep up with the times. So therefore, gravity is illegal, and they pound the gavel, write their opinion. Tomorrow morning, all of us, we get up, we get up on top of the church. I'm the politician, so I let you go first. And you jump to fly. What happens? What happens to you? What? No, 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 no. We made gravity illegal. Yeah, it's got no more power, right? It doesn't matter what we do, does it? It doesn't matter if we convince Congress, the President, the Supreme Court. God created laws that are fixed and unchanging. By the way, why did he create laws? Some people don't like the law. They're called antinomianists. For order, that's one reason. Why did he create the law, thou shalt not murder? Because you have an unalienable right to life. God created the law to protect that. Why did he create the law, thou shalt not steal? Because you have an unalienable right to property, to own. And God said, thou shalt not steal to protect See, laws are placed to protect. Why did God say thou shalt not commit adultery? Because he didn't want broken families and kids confused and beat up emotionally. He said a child has a right to a father and a mother. That's why he created that law. So those laws are created for our good. A right is something you have the freedom to exercise. You do not have the freedom to break the law. My freedom can't be, well, I have the freedom to kill. No, you can't. Why? Because it's against the law. So God gave us rights, and he protected them, like cities that were surrounded by walls of protection. That wall is the law. If we start to chisel away at God's laws, then guess where the enemy is going to come into our city? Right through where we chisel it down. Freedom is only found in the confines of the law. What are those confines? How do we know what's right and wrong? How do we know if Congress has the authority to pass a bill, just as an example? Which they haven't, but let's just say that they pass a law that abortion is legal. They never have. The courts just came out and changed the rules, and everybody accepts that. That's what happened. That little analogy I said where the Gophers get six downs and Ohio gets th Ohio State, excuse me, gets three, that's all that happened. It's not legal, but the fans all said, oh, well, I guess the referee said it. <laughs> Give me another Ohio State base, uh, base, uh, cap, you know? That's what's happened in America. If it is against the law of nature and nature's God... It cannot be a right. That's why you don't have the right to commit adultery. You don't have the right to an abortion. You don't have the right to homosexuality. You don't have the right to fornication, sex before marriage. You don't have the right to say anything you want and call it freedom of speech. There's actually laws against certain speech. Freedom of expression. You don't have that right. Once it goes outside of the parameters that God set to exist because he protected, you have no right to do a wrong thing. So this is quintessentially the American view of law and government. This is what makes us different from the world. And you all should know this. And everybody that you vote for as a candidate should know this. And not only that, but your children should know this because you should teach them this. Because this is what makes us American. This is what makes us different. It's the biblical view. And that is number one. Let's say it together. There is a God. 
We all believe that, right? So did our founders, and so should everybody that is in office right now, in public office. There is a God. Number two, do you know why? Because everybody in office needs to know that our rights come from him. Let's say it. Our rights? Because if our rights don't come from him, then those legislators might think that our rights come from them. Thirdly, they must understand that because they must understand that God instituted an ordained government for what? Let's say it together. The purpose of civil government is to secure our God-given rights. Well, Jake, that sounds like you're Bible-banging me. Actually, it sounds like I took it right out of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. If there's a creator, there's got to be a God. So there is a God with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Our rights come from that God. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, says the Declaration of Independence. It also says it in Romans 13. If you guys have read Romans 13, God is a minister to do good to you. God created government for that purpose. The Mayflower Compact was the first governing document that the English brought over, and we are offspring of the English colonists that originally formed this nation. And this is what it says at the very, well, not at the very end, but in the middle of it. It says, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Muslim faith. See, they wanted a Muslim society not what it says, by the way. little help, that wasn't an IQ test. <laughs> How about the advancement of a pluralistic society? No. Unequivocally, it was for the Christian faith, the advancement of the Christian faith. Why? Because in a Christian nation, guess what? A Muslim, a Buddhist, an atheist, a pluralist, a person who doesn't think he really exists, a person who believes in karma, they all have liberty. They all have guaranteed God-given rights. Try and find that in any other nation across the earth. Do you find it? No. We wanted a Christian nation because they wanted people to see light. And they've seen it for over 200 years coming from America. You guys pack up all those shoe boxes. Do you know how much light you're sending out there? I look at those shoe boxes and say, please don't send it to my house because it's just more junk I'll end up picking up off the floor. Because I'm spoiled. You're spoiled. Your kids are spoiled. We're all spoiled. But if we look at it from the perspective of that little treasure that's getting sent there that we spent a dollar at the dollar store to get and that's the first trinket a kid has ever had, that's a pretty amazing thing. Why is that that we're able to do that? Because we are so filthy blessed beyond our, even our own capacity, beyond in many ways godliness. We are so blessed in this nation because of these principles that we're talking about here. There's three branches of government. Our founders got that from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 33, 22, the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. There's your executive, judicial, and your legislative branches of government. Now, we have this concept that's being taught now, and it's called separation of what? Let's say it again. Separation of... Uh, will you stand up right here behind me for a second on the stage, and will you hold up this right here? Separation of church and state. I'm going to explain this by using this church building as a way to understand what separation of church and state actually means. Our founding fathers wanted separation of church and state, and I'll explain to you why. Because back in England, the king was the head of the church and the state. Can you just stand against that wall right there? Thank you very much. Come over here. And because he was the head of the church and the state, he had the power of the sword and the persuasion of men's conscience. Can you just stand against that wall right there? And if you didn't believe the way that he wanted you to, he could use his sword and off with your head. That literally happened. Or maybe he would burn you. So we wanted separation of church and state. We didn't want the government to dictate our conscience, what we could or could not believe. How many walls are in this room? Could you stand up right here for me? How many? Four walls. So we call this the four walls analogy. There's four government jurisdictions that God ordained. Civil government is one of them. That's all. There's four of them total. And the biggest and most responsible jurisdiction that he placed in this structure, just by means of the analogy, is self-government. This is where most of the responsibility lies. These other ones have smaller responsibilities. We're going to put God, since I can't fly yet, because none of you have run for office and tried to make 
gravity illegal. I can't put this on the ceiling, but we're going to put God up on the ceiling because that's where he belongs. He's above all of these government jurisdictions. He created this building, and he ordained these jurisdictions. He gave certain functions to them, okay? So the first is self, self self-government. You are responsible to obey the Ten Commandments. You are responsible for property ownership. You're responsible for your own health care. You're responsible for your own welfare. And you're responsible for your own crime prevention. That is none of these other jurisdictions' job. That is yours. Now, God knew the children weren't very self-governed. Parents, can I get an amen? That's why he gave children parents. And parents, actually, the family government takes care of education in the book of Deuteronomy. God commanded parents to educate their children. Is that the job of the civil government to educate your kids? Is that the job of the public school system? No, it's actually your job. If the public school system fails, it's because we've failed as parents. And by the way, it's just not a delegated duty. Education lies over there. How about health care? Where does your child go running when they get sick or when they hurt themselves? Who do they come to? Do they go to the government and say, I need health care, universal health care? No, it goes to the family. The family is where they go. How about welfare? Where's welfare? Believe it or not, everybody in this room that is under 18 years old, you all are big, fat welfare cases. You know that? None of you increase the bottom line in your parents' home. Do they? Does any parent have a child that's done that? Some of you are thinking, crap, my parent, my child is 24. He's still not increasing the bottom line. Yeah, so families, jurisdiction... God made it so the children would be welfare cases until they leave their father and mother and cleave to their wife and don't go live in the basement. (laughs) I'm not picking on people that have had a hard time and have had to do that. I guess I'm more picking on nowadays society has become entitled and they think mom and dad should take care of them all the way till I don't know what they think actually. I was kicked out of the house when I was 17, literally. I've been there ever since. So I, I, I have an understanding of what family jurisdiction is supposed to do. But once that welfare, once you turn 18 and you're able to be a man and become married, no more welfare. It's done at that particular point. Elderly care, stewardship of the environment. Marriage is actually a family jurisdiction. When I wanted to marry my wife, I asked her dad. Gratefully, her dad said yes. And inheritance, that all belongs in that family jurisdiction. Now, families get together. Has anybody watched Little House on the Prairie? Yeah. Laura Ingalls Wilder's from Minnesota. That's where I'm from. Whoop! Right? You all know Laura. So where did Laura Ingalls Wilder go to school? In the church, right? See, the church, all these families got together, and they created education, and they did it right there in the church. What became the hospital during a health epidemic in Walnut Grove? Does anybody remember? The church did. That's right. As a matter of fact, every hospital in this country until maybe the 50s was started by who? Churches. Think of the names. Saint this, Saint that. Mercy Hospital, Faith Hospital, Unity Hospital. These are all Christian names started by Christian churches or Christian organizations because the church handled health care as a delegated. If somebody in your congregation, their house burns down, who goes supplies their needs or, or what they have, gets them new clothes or toys for the kids or cooks them meals? Think about it. Who does that? That's right. Does your county commissioner show up with a pie and dinner? No. The church does that. It's their jurisdiction. That's why they do it. And they do it out of free will and love, not compulsion. They're not forced to do it. So the church also has a duty and a jurisdiction to preach the prophetic word of God, like I'm doing this morning, like Pastor Steve does every Sunday, to the family. See, if dad's out of work and he thinks that it's better to just drink his sorrows away, that preacher should be over there and on his case, shouldn't he? Tell him what God says about his duty as a man. That preacher should be over here telling us so. See, back in the day, we used to like preachers because they would convict us of our sin and tell us what God said not to do. Now, we don't want him to do that anymore, do we? Oh, you can't say that to me. Who are you? No, that is the church's job. And eventually, in a culture, the church becomes less and less popular. And like in the Old Testament and the prophets, sometimes they do away with the church because of that prophetic word that they're speaking. Now, over here, we have, what does that say over there on that wall? Civil government. There's two duties that God has delegated civil government to do. That's to defend the borders, administer the justice system, and defense to protect. And he gives them a sword and guns and tanks and all the other stuff that we have now. And their job is to protect 
the church, to protect the family, and to protect you. That's their job. Now, in this room, that's their only job that the Bible gives them. I'm not saying that's not what they do now. Now they do a whole bunch of other stuff, don't they? Matter of fact, I probably mentioned some things that these guys do that they're starting to take over, haven't I? And I'm going to get to that in a second. There is four walls. How many corners are in this room? Do you see how each corner is separated? Each jurisdiction is separated from another jurisdiction. Where is the separation between church and state? Point to the corner. It's right there. That's why Hillary Clinton can't kick open the doors of your church and administer your sacraments and tell you what Bible scriptures to read and tell you uh, who can and cannot get married and things like that, right? Because there's a separation of church and state. That's why when somebody steals your car, you don't call Pastor Steve and say, hey, arrest him. He stole my car. Why? Steve says, hey, I can go speak to him. I can tell him thou shalt not steal, but I have no jurisdiction over handcuffing and putting him in jail because there's a separation of what? Two different duties. That's the separation. But nowadays what society wants to lie to us and get us to believe is that there's a separation between who's on the ceiling again? They want us to think there's a separation between God and government. Is there? Government was created by him for one purpose. Do you guys remember the American view of law and government? By the way, we have a CD of this right outside. It's a great CD. You're going to love it. Let's say it together. There is a God. Our rights come from him. The purpose of civil government is to secure our God-given rights. But what we've seen, due to our apathy and us falling asleep, is government has started to crawl up their wall and get up on the ceiling so it can tell the church who it can and cannot marry, right? What it can and cannot say from the pulpit. Been telling families what they can and cannot educate their kids with. They can or cannot vaccinate their kids, what they'll eat for school lunch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So tell individuals what it can do with their, just as an example, their right to bear arms. How many of you believe we have a right to bear arms? That was a defensive mechanism that God gave in us. We have that right from him. But now that's being told to us what we can or cannot do with our own private property and how we cannot, can and cannot do it. Because government has left its wall and tried to get up here, but first they had to bite on the line of separation of church and state. Why? Because if there's a separation between God and government, then government can't tell God, or then God can't tell government what to do, in theory. Does that make sense? Does that give you a better understanding of separation of church and state? Anybody? Super. Okay. Guys, thank you very much. You can just uh, lay those down up here. Let's give these guys a hand. Creation or evolution? Some people are kind of weak-kneed on this. They don't understand it. Dr. Ken Ham, does anybody know him? He's a really great friend of ours, friend of our ministry. As a matter of fact, I'll be bringing 17-year-olds up to his ark again. I was there for the grand opening. It was wonderful. Um, and it's fascinating if you haven't been there. I really encourage it. Well, he's a much smarter man than I am, plus he's got a way cooler accent than I do. You know what I'm saying? He's from Australia. Creation says we were created equal, and we were created with national, natural rights. Evolution says certain people evolve more than others, and those people are superior than others. Has anybody ever heard of the term racism? This is where you believe that your race is better than another race, that you're somehow superior to that race. Well, that very mentality is developed. It started, its seedbed is evolution, because evolution means we evolve. And according to Adolf Hitler in the 40s, if you were black, you hadn't evolved enough. You were still an animal. That's why when Jesse Owens from Ohio State went over and spanked all those German Aryan runners and took home some gold medals for America, Hitler wouldn't give him the medal and wouldn't show up for the ceremony because he said, it's not fair for my men to run against those animals. I love how God is. He's like, hey, I, I got one of those for you. Let me just bring him over. Has anybody watched that movie? It's a great movie. I thought it was fantastic. So there you have it. And then if you were a Jew, you were less than an animal. You didn't have the right to life. You could be shot in the streets, couldn't you? Did anybody get in trouble for that? Not by the German government. You didn't have the right to property. 30% of Hitler's war budget was confiscated from wealthy Jews. Did you know that one third of the dollar bills that created the bullets and the bombs was stolen from Jews? Because you didn't have the right to property. You didn't have liberty either. You had to live in a ghetto. And if you went out past the curfew, you could be killed. And nobody had bat an eye. 
because they didn't believe the way that Americans believe that you have the right to life, liberty, and property. And the reason that Americans believe it is because the Bible says it. Evolution is very dangerous. Besides that, it doesn't say we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are evolved equal, does it? It says we're created equal in the Declaration of Independence. There's two contrasting views of what government is. The first is the pagan view of government. That says that the state is divine. Anybody remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Anybody studied the apostles' lives after the New Testament? They were all confronted with a government system, whether it be Caesar, whether it be Nebuchadnezzar, whether it be Pharaoh that thought he was God. And if he thought he was God, guess what? They had to worship him. And all of them were challenged with that, weren't they? That led to tyranny. And it was, again, based off of evolution. That was the system that it was based off of. Now I have a question, and it's one that I have no idea. What time is this service normally over? Right about now, you guys are walking out the door? You're supposed to be walking over the door, but Steve goes later. Come on, I need some intel here. Should I wind this up, or do you guys have 10 more minutes? Okay, now I don't want to make the people feel bad that really want me to line this up. So if you do leave during this time, I promise. See, the pastor wants me to wind it up, but you guys don't. Now what do I do? Oh, okay, all right. The biblical view of government says that the state is divinely ordained. God ordained it. He gave us that wall of jurisdiction. He limited that wall of jurisdiction, said stay on that wall. Don't go anywhere else. Don't get involved in the church. Don't get involved in the family. Don't get involved in the individual. He limited it. Jesus, when asked, do we pay taxes to Caesar? What did Jesus say? Yeah, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But then what did Jesus say after that? It was one of the single most limiting phrases in the New Testament. Give to God what belongs to God on the ceiling. In other words, Caesar's got a purpose. Yes, give to him. But if he goes beyond that purpose and goes into what God's purpose is, then we disobey. Just like Peter said, is it better to obey God or man? When we're confronted with that, we as Christians have to be salt and light. In other words, we have to be equipped to do so. This is going to result or lead to patriotism. What is patriotism? How many of you just can't stand on April 15th when you have to pay taxes to support our veterans? Don't you just hate that? First, we have to pay them when they're in service. Then we got to pay their health care after they're done. Then we got to pay for their amputated arms and things like that. Isn't that just horrible? I mean, gosh, I hate it. I want to do a pro I want to have a tea party. If somebody talks like that, you have my permission to punch them in the mouth. That's ludicrous. That's like telling Christ you didn't do enough. I'm very patriotic. When, those, when, those, uh, when the parades come, I stand up. When I see a veteran at a restaurant, I shake his hand. I'm grateful. You know why? Because that veteran isn't pushing health care down my throat. He's not trying to take my private property. He's not taxing me. What is he doing? He's protecting me. He's defending me. With what? His words? I promise I'm going to do this. I promise I'm going to do that. We're going to end poverty. We're going to have free school. That's the latest. Free college. <laughs> Our veterans don't say that. They say, no, we're not going to defend you with our words. We're going to defend you with our life. And that's what they do. They defend us with their life. And this is the example of that right there. Isn't it? I'm going to bounce back to this because I want to talk about how government's job is to do this. We have a DVD of this, by the way. I need to have three vol- four volunteers. Four volunteers. Can I get four volunteers? Can I get you two, and come on up here, sir, and I need one more gentleman, one more gentleman. Come on up here. Thanks, man. Now, the gentlemen get to play with swords and shields. So here's a, here's a shield for you. I'm going to get to you. I'll, I'll explain to you why you don't get a sword and a shield, because I can tell you're upset about that. <laughs> okay, yep, you, you stand right there. This is called interposition, okay? This is an analogy of what government's focus and purpose is to do. Now, I didn't get to share the four walls or the interposition for the first service, but I do want to make sure that I'm able to give it to you because this is such a, a, a great understanding and analogy. This, what's your name? Danielle. Danielle. Mm-hmm. That's a beautiful name. Danielle is Miss America. Everybody, you can whistle. Go ahead. So let's wave. Let's wave Miss America. Wave to everybody. There she is. Miss America came to America because she wanted to start, as we read in the Mayflower Compact, 
a nation based on Christian faith, right? She wanted the world to see what it would be like. She came from a persecuted situation, and she wanted unequivocally Christianity to reign paramount in this new nation. And so she did that, and pretty soon she started to prosper, because that's what happens when you abide by biblical precepts and, and the Word of God. You will prosper. You might even get rich, and there's nothing wrong with that. So she starts to get that. But what ends up happening in a nation that prospers is other people start to flood that country too. They want a little bit of that prosperity. And not all of them were Christians. Not all of them listened to the pastor when he preached on Sundays. So what she had to do, she had to ordain a jurisdiction of protection. She looked to the Bible. The Bible said that government is God's minister. So she voted together with her fellow men and and women in her area for a sheriff. That sheriff would then protect them locally. That is the local chief executive of your local government, is the sheriff. He is the law enforcement agency. So she gave him a sword and a shield. She said, protect me. So he stands right here, ready to protect her. She continues to raise her children, develop her private property, increase her commerce, educate her kids. It's a beautiful thing, and now she's protected, okay? But what ends up happening is more and more people, the population grows. Now we have need for states. They have their own interests. So she delegates the chief executive officer of the state and that would be your governor. I think he ran for president, too. He got beat pretty bad. So here's the sword and the shield right here. That's not, I shouldn't even have said that. I'm sorry. I mean, it is true, but I didn't need to say it. So here is the governor right here, Mr. Kasich. His job is to defend the state's liberties. And guess who his job is to defend the state's liberties against? Other states. And now in this particular situation, we have an external threat coming from beyond our shores and our borders. Originally, it was Britain. That's why we had a war for independence. We needed a federal system to protect those borders, to guard those borders. We give that federal system a sword and a shield. So what happens when somebody tries to attack Miss Danielle, Miss America? Who do they got to go through? They got to go through three layers of defenses. Do you think she's sweating that? No, when the terrorist comes with his box cutter, right? Bam, bam. We've never been invaded as a nation because we have a robust federal government system. But what happens when the government system, by the way, is there any attorneys in the room? Okay, good. Because most of the people up there in D.C. are attorneys. And there's a quick joke I have to tell. Two people were walking through a graveyard, two friends, and one of them saw a headstone. He nudged his friend. He said, hey, that says a lawyer and a good man on there. He said, they got two people buried in there. So there's your lawyers protecting your rights. See, they start to scheme, and they start the power goes to their head, and they want monuments and programs. They want to get off their wall of just protecting. They want to start telling people what to do and giving people free stuff, like free college and things like that. But what they don't tell the kids is they have to steal it from their retirement to give it to them now, but, you know, that's out of that. So the federal government turns around. He wants to get stuff to develop these new things, and who has the money in this equation? Danielle. So he's got to go through two layers of defense defending her constitutional rights. How many federal governments is there? How many state governments is there? Some people say 57. Depends who you ask, but there's 50. So here's the 50 right here. Who's got more power, states or federal government? That's right. So what happens when these two war? Go ahead, let's see it. Give it to a man. All right, federal government dies, he turns around, learns quickly, I can't do battle against the states. So what he does is he tries to bribe the states, just like Judas was bribed to betray Christ, right? So he takes some California money, gives it to Ohio, and then what happens? They do a deal, right? So now they both turn around with their swords and their shields that Daniel originally, go ahead, you can spin. But how many, how many sheriffs are in this country? There's over 3,000. So now you have 51 or 58, again, depending on who. But you're only going to find 51. They come with their swords and their shields, but you've got 3,000 sheriffs protecting her local, her rights locally, her constitutional rights locally. So guess who's going to win this contest? Right there. I'd really like to see this fight because you're a big guy. <laughs> uh, but, but you get the concept, right? Until the sheriff believes that we're a democracy or believes that, hey, if the government says it, it must be true, just like the referees, Right? Instead of defending and upholding the Constitution, he buys onto that line. Or maybe he's bribed off. Maybe he gets a new uh, fire station out of the deal or a tank for his county or bulletproof armor. I don't know. Anytime we bite on to what we can get, 
then we end up turning compromising, and then what do we do? Now Miss America is left here with her Second Amendment right, and that's it. So maybe she gets her sheriff, but that's about all. Her, she is going to be forced to do one of two things. What Christians have been forced to do all through the ages, once the government system started to turn against the people instead of protecting the people. You either bow down and worship me, or I will take your life, your liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. So she has a choice. She can either worship. Okay, what do you want to leave me alone? Okay, here you go, right? Oh, you just want control of my child's mind in school for eight hours a day? No problem, I'll give you that too. Do you guys get the concept here? That's what she's forced to do. Many of us are bartering in that means, and we don't really realize that it's happening right now. But it's important for us to be able to identify it so that we can stand against it and assert our constitutional muscle. Thank you very much. You guys can have a seat. As I said right there is that example of interposition. That example of interposition happened to me when I went to Teen Challenge. I was kicked out of school as a senior in high school, and I don't have time to get into this or develop it because I was, I was a dumb kid. I was sex, drugs, and partying. That's what I did. And I've been to treatment numerous times. They sent me to Teen Challenge. And needless to say, I thought everybody was crazy there. I had no clue what they were going through. I was looking for a 12-step program. They kept throwing the Bible at me. And that really made me feel like they were nuts. Because you can't beat God. You can beat a program. You can beat a secular program. That's why I love this program here at the church where they're teaching the, and I don't know why in the world I just forgot the name of it, but he just announced it up here earlier with the gal that is talking about recovery through a biblical perspective, not man-made philosophy. And Jesus Christ, I saw at that particular time when I was sitting in the church with nobody talking to me at all, it was like the roof of the building blew off and the wrath of God was coming at me like a big light, like Saruman's eye. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Lord of the Rings, right? There it was, right on me. Why was it on me? Because I was a sinner. Not because I had done drugs or partied or whatever. I wasn't thinking of that. It was because here I was, this kid who was born in the United States of America, like all of us, I had athletic abilities, I played varsity sports in eighth grade, I had academic abilities, I could have got an academic scholarship and been an engineer and maybe even went to MIT, but I did not care. I had two parents that loved me very much, gave me a great home, I lacked nothing. But I wanted to be God, I wanted to give God the finger and tell him what he could do. And I didn't care about his Jesus either who died for my sins because I was a rebellious punk kid who could have cared less. They wanted to live my own life the way that I wanted to live it. And when I knew that wrath of God was coming at me, the only thing that I could do is say, how in the world can I escape this? Because I know I'm wrong. I know I'm full of sin. And I know what I've done is wrong. And I know I'm not getting out of this position that I'm in on my own. So I grabbed a Bible. It's what we all grab when we're in trouble, isn't it? Oh, Jesus, help me. I know I haven't talked to you for a long time. It's how pathetic we are. We're so sinful. We're such frail creatures that don't deserve his love at all. Because any of you, if your husband went and cheated on you, you might forgive him once, but what if he did it on a weekly basis? Oh, no, come on back in, honey. It's fine. I know you love me. No, you don't, or you wouldn't cheat. But that's what we give in exchange for the love of God, our cheating. That's what we've done in this nation, isn't it? Because it doesn't matter about a constitution, that can't keep us holy. It doesn't matter about who you put in office because they're not God. What matters is Christ and Christ-like principles. And if we'll hold the standard to ourselves, because the reason the political system isn't is because we aren't. Because this constitution starts out with the words, we the... That's right, we are the authority. It's through the consent of the governed. They're not the problem, we're the problem. And until we stop being the problem in our homes, if we can't be a priest of our own household and obey God's word and give a good example. What in the world do you think is going to happen in the seats of power in our nation? If we're too busy at the football game and we're not reading our word every day. Have any of you forgot to eat for three days in a row before? How many of you have forgot to read your Bible for three days in a row? Maybe a week in a row? Maybe a month in a row? Maybe a year in a row? How many of you are Christians who have read this thing cover to cover? If you haven't, then how in the world do you tactically know your defense? Is there any veterans in here? Did they just throw you a gun and say, figure it out? and then throw you into war even though you didn't have your gun figured out. You took that thing apart daily. You cleaned it. You needed to be intimate with your weapon. We as Christians need to be intimate with the word of God. And there is zero excuse why you're not if you call yourself a Christian. I'm not challenging whether God saved you or not. I already told you. When I was in that room, I had nothing to do, and I went to Acts 17, and I saw that Paul was forgiven of his sins, and I saw Jesus Christ, the great sin killer, step up with his shield and interpose his love for me. What is the song that Ebenezer is in? 
the, uh, the hymn, Come Thou Fount. You guys have heard that hymn before. Come Thou Fount of many blessings. It talks about Christ interposed his precious blood between me and that wrath of God. I saw Christ, but it wasn't a shield. It was his body. And I've served him every day since. I've read his word every day since. I pray every single day. I have such a dependency on him because I know what he saved me from. And now I travel all over the country, and we do as Institute on the Constitution because I know what he saved me too, and that's to speak this prophetic word to everybody in the nation that I possibly can. I don't have that message. There's one way you can help us. You can become a partner of ours. I'd be anxious to talk to any of you about that back there. We send out a newsletter every single week. We're in a different state. We're doing a different event all the time. I will show you where your seed money is going. I promise that every week. We also have different materials back there. We have our Constitution course that you can take. It's 12 lectures, 20 minutes per lecture. It's a small-time investment, but it gets you intimate with the documents that I think we need to be intimate in. Would you agree? And think about us parents. If we don't know it, guess what? Our kids know even less. They are teaching less and less about what this is, but there's moral progressivism now that is teaching about how it is bad and we need to change it. That is what's being taught now. That is li- I'm sorry to say that, but that is literally what is being taught now. Unless you're teaching it to your kids. We have a course of study for homeschoolers, private schools, and public schools because every kid needs a credit. This offers that civics credit for your students. We also have little novelty items that are in the back there as well. Now, I want to take this opportunity to pray. And Pastor Steve told me, pray however you want. He said, bring them up to the altar if you want. I want to pray for a couple things. The first thing is, what's more important to me than even what I just discussed today is salvation in Christ. So I want to ask that we do this. Um, This is so different, because I speak in so many different denominational churches, so I'm going to do the easiest one that flows out there. Um, How many of you believe we've been doing a good job of being Christians in this room? How many of you think that we could all work on that a little bit more in our work, in our home? Everybody raise your hand if you feel that way. Awesome. We can hold each other accountable in love. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for everybody who is honest today that says, you know what, I can do more, I can be better. Because Christ, you're our standard that we'll never quite attain to, but Christ in us has attained. And I thank you for that, that you hear these prayers. And I thank you now, Father, that the Spirit of God is over the top of Ebenezer Church and it's in us right now. It's in this church building. Help quicken us, Lord, when we have those discussions with those that we work with. Help quicken us when we're discussing them at home to teach our children as you commanded Moses to command the children of Israel to do. Let us be able to articulate, articulate deep answers, not just shallow things but because the Bible says or because Jesus says or because that's what we do as Christians, that we could know these things intimately in our homes, that we could walk one with you, Christ. I also pray for our nation Father, you said the government is upon your shoulders. And I thank you, Father, as a nation right now, as we experience chastising like we've never experienced before. I pray that godly men and women will be placed in seats of power, Father, that righteousness and judgment pour down, like it says in the book of Joel. And Father, it can be done at the hands of your righteous. We agree in this room right now for this election that it sets on your shoulders. And I thank you that godly men and women are appointed. And Father, in those areas where they're not, because men are flawed, I thank you that we can stand accurately as Christians. And now this leads me to my next one, guys, as we're all praying. And if you don't mind keeping your heads down. For those of you that are in this room right now that know you don't have a connection and a union with Jesus Christ, the creator of the earth, a connection and a union like I just described earlier, when the ceiling flew off the church, it didn't actually happen, but that's what I saw in my heart of faith. And Christ convinced me of being a sinner. And you're convinced this morning that you absolutely unequivocally know that today, if you were to meet your maker, Christ is not in you to save you. If you're that person in this room, will you please raise your hand so I can pray for you? Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that those that don't know, those who have raised their hand, Father, that they would know They would know the God of the universe, the God of the kingdom of heaven and earth. And I thank you that you meet them and you speak to them sweetly through your word, as you do to me daily, Father. That, Father, you would whisper love to them when they feel condemnation. That you would apprehend their soul from their enemy, Father. And I thank you in Jesus' name, Father, that that union grows and grows and grows as it starts today, Father. That there would be a tree planted by rivers of living water. 
And they're ready, Father, in Jesus' name, to give an answer in this society, Father, in this culture that we live in. I thank you for the breath of heaven to breathe upon us. I thank you for Pastor Steve as the man of God in this church. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would fill him with your boldness. You'd refresh him as he's gone right now. And Father, I thank you that the flame continues to burn and expand and grow in Ebenezer Baptist Church. May this seed that has been planted this morning in everybody's heart, Father, I pray it brings forth fruit. And where my words have gotten away, I thank you that you would cast them out like the east and west, Father. But that which his faith would be built on in the hearts of all those present. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. I would love to speak to you out there in the hallway uh, when service is through. Thank you. So before anyone leaves, I know it's almost, hey, look, it's almost 2 o'clock. That clock's wrong. You've been here longer than you thought. Before anyone leaves, I uh, want to say, first of all, that I appreciate Jake and what he said, and of everything that he has said, I think the greatest thing that was just witnessed in this room was, have we been the Christians we're supposed to be, and no one raised their hand? That's amazing. Why do I say that? One reason, because our natural tendency is to look at our nation and point to Washington. I don't think so. I think it's us. I think we've withdrawn from the culture. And now that we're being infiltrated, now we're trying to take it back. Maybe. Not that it was ever ours to begin with, but maybe. And so that's a challenge for me, for you. I told the first service that one of the things that I'm really disappointed in myself is that I'm not more disappointed that I lay down every night sleep knowing that 3,000 babies are being dismembered every day. I sleep peacefully knowing that's happening in this country. And so do you. There's not brokenness for our nation among us, God's people. You think about the children of Israel, the people that were supposed to be the very light to the world. Paul, in turn, tells the Corinthian church, don't be like them. It's amazing. Don't be like them. You know that there's other nations looking at America right now in the situation we're in, especially politically, and going, what has happened? What's happened to America? The Christian light is dimming. One of my, uh, it's not a pastor, he's an elder, um, but he's also an apologist, one who defends the faith. He does great work with Islam. And he was over in another country talking, trying to escape, hoping that being over in another country, being there teaching and debating, that he would escape the talk, the political talk, and it's still over there. It has nothing to do with him, and it's in discussion. And... He made this statement. He said, the time will come, which, biblically speaking, in times, whether it's now or in the future, it's going to happen. doesn't mean we don't care. He said that superficial, shallow Christianity is going to be no more. In other words, if we're superficial in our Christianity, if we're shallow, we're not going to survive if we face hardship. And so that's my challenge for myself, for you, is it just, it's not just about the political arena. It's about me. It's about Jesus saying, you are a city on a hill. You are salt. You are light. Where you're at now in your families, in your workplace. And I always, I always ask our young people when we talk about this, I say, are people shocked when they find out you claim to be a Christian? Are they shocked? Really? Huh, never would have thought that. Or is it just, yeah, they figured so. Our behavior matters. What we do matters in this culture. We don't have the greatest reputation in America being Christians. And most of the time it's simply just because of our attitude towards wickedness. We're arrogant about it. I've done it. But those are the things that we're going to have to deal with in the future. Be prepared. may not be you individually. But be prepared that at some point you're going to be lied about. Christopher and I met, many of you know, a few years ago with the Fellowship of the Rainbow, the LGBT, and at Hawking. Great conversation. We did it in as best of love as we could. Great conversation. They turned around and lied about us in the afternoon, Athens News. What do I expect them to do? So I say that as a challenge, just to examine your own life and to think about these things. But I also say that 
This is going to switch gears for you for a minute. But I would ask for all of you that you would stay in the sanctuary um, for now, just because nothing's wrong, because there is a situation at the end of the driveway. It's not here. And um, the cops are there. The guy, we're going to pray for him, actually. That's the best thing we can do. And um, he's on drugs. He's drugged up. And it's being taken care of, but it's blocked. You can't get out anyways. So let me ask you this. How many of you have a history of addiction? How many of you have a history of just gross sin that you're ashamed to even talk about? Have I been redeemed by the blood of Christ? Can he be redeemed by the blood of Christ? Amen. So he goes by Joe, right? So let's pray for Joe. Let's pray for Joe. Father, thank you for the day you've given us today. Thank you for our freedom to gather here. And I pray, Father, that you would uh, work in our hearts as we've heard about our nation. Forgive us that we're so quick to point to Washington and leaders and fail to see ourselves. Fail to examine ourselves and to see, am I salt and light where you've placed me? And I pray, Father, that you would work in our hearts, that we would repent as your people. And begin to see things as they are, to begin to be salt and light where you've placed us. To be, begin to be passionate about you in the workplace, in our families, wherever you've placed us. That our deeds may be done before men, that they may see them and give glory to God, as Jesus said. And I pray that you help us. Pray for Joe right now, Father, knowing that we've been in bondage to sin in different forms. And I pray, Father, as there. Uh, have him detained and um, just working on uh, getting us out of here and uh, dealing with the situation, be it the officers, you'd be with Joe and that you would work in his heart. Father, he is rebellious just like we are. And I pray, Father, that you would work in his heart and the gospel, the name of Jesus Christ would be mentioned. And at that name, Father, that he would bow and that you would redeem him. You would redeem him from his situation. Father, you would redeem him from his life of sin. And Father, we know that you have the power because the gospel is the power unto salvation. And I pray, Father, that you would grant that to him. Be merciful to him as you have been to us. And I pray, Father, that we would remember him, not just in this moment, but the days to come. And ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you guys just want to hang out, great time of fellowship. (laughs) And... You have kids changed since now. They said they're going to be a few more months. Okay, be a few more. If you have children, have at it. Go get them. Jake's out here. If you want to harass him, you know, actually go harass Jake. He needs to be harassed. And so we'll give you the word when they everything's cool and clear. Again, we want to thank you for listening to this message from the Ebenezer Baptist Church. If you would like other messages or just general information about the Ebenezer Baptist Church, you can connect with us again on Facebook or on the web at www.ebc1837.com or you can call the church office at 740-385-8411.